Hola. Hola. Uh, I'm very honored to be here with all of you tonight or this afternoon. And before I even start, I want to set up clear expectations of this time with together. First expectation is that talking about multicultural realities in the United States is a very difficult subject. So I'm going to highlight specifically the Hispanic community in this talk, but with a more universal view. Now, when I speak about the Hispanic community, please know that there is a lot of diverse realities just under that group. So I will try to talk about the generalizations of the reality, but of course, depending on the area that you are in, the reality might be different. The second reality, the expectation I want to clarify is I'm not a theologian. So that's not what I'm going to concentrate in. What I'm going to concentrate in is in the 22 years that I have of working in ministry in a parish, diocesan, archdiocesan, and now in a university. So hopefully we will be able to talk about some of those topics. I also want to let you know that my experience is based working with the youth. And that, those are the lenses that I'm going to give you. And I hope with that, through those lenses, you are able to create uh, connections to the reality of the ministry that you are uh, representing in your journey of faith. When I talk about the Hispanic community and with my beautiful Southern accent, uh, I also want to let you know that I have also worked with different communities. So I have worked with the African American community. I have worked with the uh, South Korean Catholic community, with the Indian community, with the Vietnamese community, with the Hispanic community, of course. There you go, with the Hispanic community, of course, and also with the Anglo community. There you are. Those are the lenses that I bring, and I think that with the skills I'm going to try, or the highlights of the areas of the skills that we need to develop that I'm going to try to highlight today, hopefully you will be able to implement a more co-responsible co uh, response to the multicultural church. So what is my first reality? Usually when we talk about multicultural realities, uh, people would say, you are just talking about the Hispanic community. Why the Hispanic community? Why you don't care about the other cultures? Yes, you care, but there is a problem. The moment that we group all the groups, to, all the cultures together, in reality, in practicality, someone is going to lose. Uh, this is happening now more and more in the dioceses. When we used to have an office for the African American community, an office for the Vietnamese community, an office for the Hispanic community, and now we're just putting them together into a multicultural uh, office. So what I want to say is that I'm not ignoring the other realities, I'm just going to base the first in one, so then we can be more sensitive and more aware of all the other realities that we should be aware of. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. Now, co-responsibility. If you work in the church, if you have served the church, if you're part of the church, that's a very overwhelming topic. It's not an easy solution. There are many issues that are going to come your way. But what I want us to do here right now is to start to think of some practical solutions, practical movements that we can do to start to embrace that co-responsibility more effectively. In a sense, we're going to move from Mary to Martha. But that doesn't mean I'm ignoring Mary. But let's talk a little bit about Martha. In archery, your goal is to get the target with your arrow. And hopefully, you are so good at it that you're going to hit a jackpot. You're going to hit the red, uh, the red ring, right? That's the goal. What I think is happening in the church right now is that we have worked so hard on the arrow we have perfected the arrow so well. Every time we get a new arrow, because we have seen the design, the material, the content, uh, we have improved and we started to become almost a consumeristic culture in the church of what is the new program, what is the new book, what is the new thing that we can do, concentrating in the arrow. What I think the church needs to start to concentrate now is no longer in the arrow. We have a lot of amazing arrows out there that if you actually do it correctly, you're going to be successful. What we need to start to concentrate now with the reality of the church is in the archer. We need to start to concentrate on the technique of how to use the muscles and how to be more effective in our aim to the target. 
And that is something that you cannot learn in, the, in, in theory. That's something that you need to practice and practice and practice once again. Because what we have seen in many cases, especially trying to address the Hispanic community, is like, oh, this is a great content. Just translate it and you send it out, good luck. You know what is the solution? You need to be aware of the realities and what is in the mind of the culture so then you can aim and effectively touch their hearts. So here is my invitation for us. Let's talk about why it's hard to talk about co-responsibility with the Hispanic community. These are some of the realities that we embrace. I'm sorry. The first reality is the Hispanic community is blessed abundantly in Latin America with vocations to the religious life and to the priesthood. So the idea of having lady working with our clergy is kind of hard to believe. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to see. My first experience happened when I was in the first parish and I moved from youth minister to director of pastoral ministries. I went to all the masses where they were making the announcement that I was the new director of pastoral ministries. And in every single mass, as soon as it was announced, it was a, like almost a standing ovation. Everybody was very joyful. Then I went to the Spanish mass. And the moment that that was announced, this sound came out of everybody. <gasps> to the point that was like, what's going on? I have been working with them for five years and they, we have a very good relationship. But when I heard it, oh, then one of the abuelas that was sitting in the front, she said, what about the sisters? What about the sisters? And immediately the sisters were right next to me. They run to the microphone and say, no, 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 wait. Catherine is gonna direct us. She's gonna teach us and give us new uh, tools so we can be more effective with you. We are excited about this. And then everybody is like, okay. And then I got the standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> but trust me, that was a really eye-opening moment for me. The second reality is we cannot ignore that the Hispanic community has very connected to their DNA, the machismo culture is still. Which means in government, in, in business, in the decision making at home, men still are the ones making the decision. However, the fate is transferred by the mothers. So that is still is a pull and, and, and a situation, a, a confrontational situation that brings some challenges when here in the United States we are asking the Hispanic community, let's be co-responsible. Another layer that we need to be very aware of, and, and Betsy covered a little bit about this, is the seminarians that we have received so graciously in the last 20 years in the Catholic Church. I don't think there is one diocese that can say they don't have a seminarian coming from as an immigrant community, either from Nigeria, from Latin America, or from India. And I don't think the Catholic Church in the United States could survive without all those vocations that we have right now. So I'm very grateful for the gift. But we do have a reality that the expectations and the understanding of what priesthood and how priesthood work for all of our diverse uh, uh, seminarians can create conflict if both parts, the parishioners and the, and the priests, are not willing to collaborate with each other to explain the expectations and re the reality of the church here in the United States. And the last part, the, the, the core responsibility component is difficult for the Hispanic community is because just until now, especially this is a very good year for the Hispanic Catholic uh, community, we have Archbishop Gomez as the president of the USCCB. That was a big deal. If you know, didn't know, if you go to social media, he received a certain uh, uh, mariachis uh, sent by the community to celebrate for him, for, for, to, with him for that amazing achievement. And the second one big celebration happened with Archbishop Perez. The Hispanic community is finally starting to see in the leadership of the clergy that they are also reflected. So just until now, that comfort of talking with, relating with, is very significant. Why I mention all this? Because if there is one thing that you can leave from this session is, if you ever see or interact with a Hispanic leader in your ministry, please understand 
that that person is a brave person that is going through more than two or three layers of obstacles of what the culture have taught us what to do and what not to do to be able to express our own opinion. So respect their voice, open a space, and be generous and understanding of the graciousness and the bravery of those that are trying to be leaders or they want to work with you. Now let's talk about a little bit of the, about the reality of the Hispanic community in the United States. The results of the fifth national encuentro that occurred in uh, 2019 are telling us that there are 30 million of Hispanic uh, Catholics living in the United States. Of those, approximately 13.5 million are immigrants and 60.6 .6 are born in the United States. I saw this shift in the practical field six years ago, and you can tell whatever we were do sorry, whatever we were doing with them, it was not working anymore. Why? Because they came with a whole new foreign culture. They come with a completely different uh, reality. And something that we need to learn from the Hispanic community and from the Anglo community is that if we want to embrace this new culture, we need to let them teach us how. Because I don't think either side knows how. And we don't want to lose them in the journey. About half of the Hispanic uh, uh, Catholics in the United States are under the age of 30. So when in many faith traditions that are struggling to keep the youth, the Hispanic community is booming with young people. There is a great future here. However, I also have other statistics that are not as exciting. Less than half of the Hispanics in our country still identify as Catholics, about 47%. As far as the memory goes, we have practically taken a granted an, uh, the assumption that the majority of Hispanics are Catholic no longer. And that's a commentary from Dr. Ospino, who follows the Hispanic community very well. Personally, in my travels around the nation, I have seen this for years. Actually, if you look at the video of my Cultures of Formation uh, talk two years ago, and I was talking about the going, going, going research, I told you, this is what is showing right now for the Anglo community, but just wait until you see the disaffiliation for the uh, Hispanic community. It's a lot bigger. Why this is significant? Because 10 years ago, 70% of the Hispanic community in the United States claimed themselves being Catholic. Now, in 10 years, we went down to 47. It's something to be aware of and something that we need to be responsible about. Now, let's talk about uh, co-responsibility in dialogue. Dialogue is something that implies that you are going to be willing to have intent in, in, to be aware and be open to be listening to the other person. Pope Francis actually, with the Synod to the Youth in these past uh, two years, have given us the perfect example of how to do it. The first thing that he did is he called leaders of the youth, uh, young adults around the, the world, to come to the Vatican and spend a, a couple of days, I think it was almost a week, with him to talk about the different issues of the youth and the young adults. After that, he went and, and had his guiding with his bishops to talk about what he heard from the uh, youth and to hear the wisdom also of his uh, bishops. After that, he gave us the exhortation letter where he communicated, and for, you don't see this in many documents of the Vatican, he's quoting the voices of the youth and young adults, people that he interacted with in this document, as well as the, with the bishops, as well as with his own opinions and his own suggestions to the church. That is extraordinary. And in many ways, we are kind of used to receive those kind of documents from the Vatican. Here is the amazing thing. After that, he also created uh, international young adult board that is going to be connected to the, to the, uh, with his work for the next um, three years. The representative of the United States, there are only 10 representatives in that board from the United States is Brenda Noruega. If you have the pleasure to meet her, please do so from the Diocese of San Bernardino. She did a fantastic job. She's an extraordinary woman. And she had an amazing experience. And she was invited by the bishops uh, this past November uh, to speak in front of them and to tell them more about the experience and the information from Christo Vivid. She went there. She was nervous. 
And this is what I can tell you what happened in front of the bishops. She went there, she presented, she got uh, the attention of the bishops, and then she left. Now, let me tell you what happened with the Hispanic community. This was like our Super Bowl moment. <laughs> Everybody was glued to the live stream. Every time that she spoke, people were clapping. Like if you were talking like to the, your favorite politician or musician or whatever, we were so excited. However, around the nation, I noticed this movement that so many times we don't realize we can embrace by actions, not by words. She was invited to speak in front of the bishops. She was invited to give her testimony. And then at the end, there was an opening mic for questions. And guess what happened? Zero questions. You know what happened with the Hispanic young adults that were watching with me? Their number one question was tears in their eyes, and they're like, they don't get it. Catherine, they don't get it. And I was like, surprised. I wasn't that attached to it, but clearly they were. And I said, what happened? And they said, Bishop Barron just spoke before her and talk about this affiliation of the church with the experts. And bishop after bishop after bishop stood up with many questions. But they didn't have one question for the ones that are here now. Sometimes we can have the best of intentions, but we don't realize consciously that our reactions and our actions of invitation of dialogue is what can disrupt that, that, that that community and that open dialogue between the two sizes. So don't worry, I represented the church and I was like, but guess what, she was there and she's gonna be there for three years. So I tried to cheer them up. But even I look back and yes, I invite you to look at the live stream of, of those conferences. And that's something that we need to work on. Co-responsibility on a mission. I have the opportunity to travel to many places, to many dioceses to go talk about different uh, aspects of the church, but especially to help people thrive, especially with this new reality of, of a multicultural church. One day, I was in a national conference. I was speaking to probably a room this size of just diocesan and directors. It was a full house. And after they did the whole presentation, one of them raised her hand, and she has worked in the church for many, many years. She said, Catherine, all what you said makes perfect sense, and I like it. But I cannot work with the Hispanic community because I don't want to break the law. I was surprised. I was glad that I created an environment that she felt comfortable to say that, because she wasn't not treading me. She was just really concerned to say, this is just, I'm not going to do it, period. And the sad thing is many other diocesan and directors have the same feeling. So this is what I have for you for an invitation. This is an essay that one of the students from the Catholic University of the Americas uh, gave me to review. And actually, when I saw it, so I was like, can I quote you? Can I, can I mention that? His, uh, his reaction to what being a migrant is, immigrant is, was connected to this thought. The history of forced migration and refugees is nothing new for the humanity, but traces back itself back to the beginning of time in the ancient text. The exile of Abraham's surrogate wife, Hagar? Hagar? Oh, sorry, I don't, that's where the accent comes, so you, you can read it. The wandering of Jacob and even the patriarchs of humanity, Adam and Eve, a reflection of humanity in exile and refugee from the biblical narrative. Our church is based in the scriptures. And you can see through all Old Testament, even through the New Testament, how many times people were forced to exile, how many times people were forced to leave either because of violence, because of finances, or because of mission. So we as a church have the history to be open to the immigrant the whole time. And whenever you are called to serve a culture that you don't feel comfortable with, I just ask you to go back to claim the roots of your faith and to understand that the basics of everything is that we are pilgrims in this life. Our faith itself is the journey that we start in point A, and together we're going to walk together the, the walk of Emmaus so we can have that encounter with Christ. And if you live in your own place your whole life, first of all, be glad and be blessed, because that's a gift. But the spiritually, God is asking us to move from point A to point B. And why I mention this? Because when we see that reality, 
we can understand that we can get something for all the immigrants that have come through this country. And we don't need to be that much territorial about being patriotic, because this is not about not being patriotic. This is our calling, our faith. Our faith is to proclaim the good news to all the nations, the wonderful deeds to all his people. That's what we are called to do. And even I love how Pope Francis in Evangelii that Guardian says, how beautiful it is to see the young people are the street preachers, callejeros de la fe, joyfully bringing Jesus to every street, every town, every square, every corner on earth. Here is my question to you. Are we being responsible to the ministry that we have been called to becoming callejeros de la fe? The number one question I have when I was doing youth ministry in, a, in my first parish, very brand new in youth ministry, trying to figure it out if I knew what I was doing, but you know, clearly I wasn't, but I was learning. Uh, was the day that I have that student that makes your life miserable? <laughs> and you kept going like, I just realized you are in the church, you cannot ask someone to leave. Seriously, I really said, if you really don't want to be here, go. And he was like, no, I'm here. <laughs> so that's how I grew in wisdom. <laughs> and I learned one thing. Yes, it's uncomfortable sometimes the people that come to us. But are we creating ministry where we go out and reach out the ones that are not coming to us? Are we really open to that? Or we just don't want to serve those that we feel comfortable with that are part of our community? Co-responsibility on vocation. My vision to this point is the following. The Catholic Church has a beautiful uh, a structure of support between the bishops to the priests, the priests to the community, the, the shepherds of our own parishes. And that works well. But unfortunately, because of all the demands of what priesthood is right now, many times they don't have the opportunity to, be real, uh, to have that one-on-one -on -one contact often. Most likely, if you know priests, they are running around 24-7 all the time, and I really feel sorry for them. One beautiful moment that I experienced during the fifth national encuentro was that in one of the evenings, there was a meal for the young adults with the bishops, just the young adults, so all the older ones have to get out. <laughs> and each bishop was seated at the table, and young adults from around the nation were able to have an open dialogue to them. What I loved is that in, from their own initiative, they asked the bishops, because this happened right after the scandal came out again. They said, can we pray for you? And it wasn't the Hail Mary full of grace, that's it. It was a true prayer that took more than 20 minutes. That's when I saw bishops truly touched by the moment and the gift that we, those that are baptized, and that want to follow the mission of the church, can support our own priests and our own bishops. The other part is, in reality, as a lay ecclesiastic minister, when I work in a parish, I spend more time with my priest than probably the bishop has the opportunity to interact with them. And when we're talking about co-responsibility, I can witness if my priest is doing well or not. I can know how much stress the priest is in. I can know when the priest is struggling, let's say, with an addiction. For, to alcohol, for example. You don't know how painful it is as a lay ecclesiastic minister to be working for the church and on a Sunday walking around and not finding the priest. First, you get worried about their health. Then to realize that they couldn't wake up because they drank too much the night before. That's when it becomes painful. So when we see those realities, we can be that support to let them know you need help right now. We can be that support in prayer. This is not just judging the support in prayer, but we can also look at them when they are losing that spark of joy of their ministry and just remind them, what is it that is missing? Why you are not joyful? So I remember one time talking, talking to one of the bishops I have worked with. He didn't look good, let's say it that way. And I look at him and say, bad day? And he say, oh, Catherine, these are the dates I dread as a bishop. And I say, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna pray for you. And then I stay quiet and I say, what is something that you really miss from your vocation? that now as a bishop you haven't been able to do for so long. And he said, Catherine, I miss reconciliation. I haven't been able to offer the sacrament of reconciliation in a very long time. My agenda is packed. So I went around, looked to some parishes, and I found that one of the parishes that weekend was celebrating uh, the first reconciliation for uh, First Holy Communion students. And I checked in his schedule and I signed him up without telling him. <laughs> <laughs> 
So he went trying to figure out what it was. Uh, trust me, there is a huge level of trust at this point, and he knows what my intentions. I, I don't have that kind of power. No one does. Uh, you have to see him the next Monday. He was literally leaping of joy. And he came with a smile and he said, you don't know how amazing it was to hear the children and to be part of it. And he just got, you know, uh, he just got back his vocation. And there is nothing more appealing, more joyful than to see a priest that loves his priesthood, a bishop that loves to be a bishop and to love to serve his, his people. The other aspect that we can help tremendously as the laity is to also provide those breaches of connection between reality and what the church is expecting the people to do. To do. So this past June, I had the opportunity to be invited by all the bishops from Alaska. And they wanted to have this amazing experience of nine days where we were traveling all around Alaska. And they opened up uh, the mic for young adults and teenagers to ask them questions. But they were smart. They asked two MCs to come and help them out to the transition of this experience. Because let's be real, opening the mic to young adults, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> so my first day, first experience, first question. Bishops, if I am in danger of death, why I cannot FaceTime my priest and ask them for absolution? So then I, don't, I know I will, I will receive absolution, I will go to heaven. And, and that will be the easiest way to connect, connect with them. I turned to the bishops, and one of them, I'm not going to say who, whisper, I'm not going to answer the question. That's disrespectful. And I look at him and say, wait, wait, wait. So I look back and I say, can I ask a question, bishops? And they're like, OK. And I say, I went back to the young adult, and I they actually was a teenager. And I say, why are you asking that question? And he said, well, Catherine, I always wondered if a shooter comes to my school, and I know I'm going to die. I want to go to heaven, so why I cannot FaceTime the priest so I can receive absolution before I die? I want you to remember the story that Carrie told us yesterday about her daughter at the table, that the way that she wanted to die was saving someone else. This is a real concept from the youth. They know that it might happen. So when the bishops understood that part of the story, their body language, their uh, disponibility changed completely. And they opened to this amazing dialogue that make a huge difference between the two communities that were there. Trust me, the first day was difficult. But the, by the day, day nine, we were experts. We were, they were like, OK, Catherine, give it in. And then someone asked a very crazy question. And I was like, I don't know the answer to that one. So I just, <laughs> that's just reality. But also in co-responsibility, as laity, we have to give thanks to the priests and, and bishops that are around us. Because many times, because it's our profession, we become very Martha-oriented. And the priests and the bishops are the ones that have to center us back and say, remember, this is about ministry. Why? Because we want to achieve, we want to complete, we want to finish. So my experience with this priest, Father Nieti Akata, eh, it was my day that everything was starting. I have 200 volunteers coming that evening for this huge event. So I'm running around, and he kept bugging me that he wanted to do something with me. And I just, at one point, I said, Farakata, I cannot do it today. Tomorrow, you have me all day if you want to, but not today. And he said, Catherine, this is not an option. You're coming with me. That wasn't very friendly. <laughs> but I went. He took me to his car. He drove around. And we went to a place where the wife of the sheriff of the city just died. And the family have asked us to pray for them. And because it was the wife of the sheriff, there was the FBI and all that stuff around, because they were trying to make sure it was a natural death. We there, were there. We prayed. We consoled the family. Then I drove back with him. And before I went back to the office, he said, now, Catherine, how is your day going? He sent me back. I know I prepared. I knew we have everybody energized. Everything is ready. But it's not about the event. It's not about how well I can control God. God is going to make his presence in that day. And he did. So I can guarantee that that happens. Got responsibility in professional development. This is a very interesting part. For years, those that were working in the church as a laity, 
uh, they wanted to be recognized professionally and they understood the responsibilities that it implies to receive enough education so we can answer the baptismal call to serve the community. So the, there was a creation of the alliances to create a, a national certification in which for the first time, anyone that received this national certification with very high quality requirements will be able to be certified and that certification will be valid in any diocese you want to. Uh, what happens right now is if I go to the diocese of, let's say, Raleigh, and I get a certification, that certification only works in the diocese of Raleigh. I go to another diocese, I have to start all over again, for those of you that are comfortable, uh, aware of that. And I'm talking about certifications after you receive your master's. I'm not talking before you receive your master's. So this has started in 2011, and there are two areas that I want to concentrate on because it's the area of expertise. Youth ministry leader, and including pastoral juvenil hispana, and that says a youth ministry leader, including pastoral, pastoral juvenil hispana. I apply to those four certifications as a diocesan, as a youth minister for the Anglo community and for the Hispanic community. I did the whole process, I have all the qualifications, and guess what? I got two of them. I got the diocesan level and the uh, youth minister level. I did not receive the pastoral juvenil near for the diocese or for the parish. But here is the reason why. I'm not complaining to you because I'm still sad about it. I'm here to tell you that the answer that they gave me is, Catherine, we cannot prove that you are Hispanic enough. So my answer was like, this accent is not my good acting. <laughs> like, this is me. <laughs> So uh, the reason why they couldn't give me the certification is because they were asking, where did you study uh, pastoral juvenil? And I gave them all my classes of CEPI. But they went to CEPI and they couldn't find any records. I went to the diocese. Of course, the office was closed, so that DNA exist anymore. I went to the director that was at that time, got a letter from her and a letter from the bishop saying that I did attend for two years those classes. And then that wasn't enough. They needed on paper. And then there was the second point. Catherine, you have never held a position where you only serve the Hispanic community. That's why you didn't get approved. Guess what? 20 years ago, there were no full-time positions to working for the Hispanic community. So why do I mention this? When we create these kind of expectations for professionalism, we need to understand what is the reality of the church. Where is it that we are at? So then we can offer that professionalism to everybody. Now, here is the amazing thing. In youth ministry itself, there have only been 15 awards that have been given nationally. I hold two of those 15. So clearly, there is something broken in the process. And this is even the sadder part. No one has received the pastoral juvenile one yet. And there are plenty of experts in the nation for that. Another part that I hold in my job is uh, a strong foundations for Catholic leaders, which, see, which sees a very outstanding leaders that are working right now in the church, and that probably they have high possibilities that they are going to become the future executive directors of the church for Catholic organizations or directors for the dioceses. When we did this research, we were looking for young adults. And yet what I found is that what I was trying to look for the multicultural church the age group was a little bit older. Although their education and their experience was the same level, for the multicultural members, it took us longer to get there. And why is that? Because in the Catholic Church, we have organized a system that in the diocese, you will find a position for youth ministry, young adult ministry, evangelization, discipleship, pro-life office, marriage and life, and one office for Hispanic ministry or one office for African-American community. What that makes is that if there are 14 of us experts in the nation, we are 14 of us fighting for one position. When from the other side, the Anglo community, as an expert, you can qualify to any of those other six or seven positions that exist. So we are noticing that there is a delay on the, on the opportunity for lay ecclesiastic ministers that are multicultural to raise up to the leadership uh, tables, not because we're looking for power, but because we want our voices to be present in the tables that are making decisions. 
This is another reality that we have to be aware of. In your parishes, how many of, of employees you have for all the ministries and how many are just uh, overseeing the Hispanic community? Corresponsibility and opportunities of few new Catholic, uh, uh, new Catholic ministries. Uh, the Hispanic community is showing us the Holy Spirit is working in a very specific ways. Um, Vicente de, de Real is one of our Strong Foundation members, and he has created Iscali. Iscali is a ministry that is happening in Chicago, and the, it comes from the word, uh, from the Aztec language, which translates to resur resurgence, uh, to begin again, which is the name that can capture the essence of mission to renew the spirit of young people as well as the way to evoke pride to the rich Catholic heritage to the Mexican Americans and others. Why this ministry is so successful and why this ministry is not happening in the church? It's not because they are against the church. It's not because uh, there is any, the bishops and the, and the priests are very aware of the ministry and they are part of it. They celebrate uh, masses, they do retreats and all that with them. The difference is our churches have a schedule where the Hispanic young adults cannot attend. They are free from 11 p.m. until midnight on a Friday night. How many parishes are open so those ministries can happen? Who can be there to work? So this location that they have created have opened the space to the needs of the Hispanic first, second generation um, uh, communities. And that's where they are starting to receive a the connection to their faith. They are offering also not only the retreats and the faith formation that is necessary, but they are also offering the specific needs with the message of the immigrant. You know what is the feeling to know that you are here, but you are neither from here nor there? That in both communities that you live in, no one understands you 100%? That is a very big challenge, and there is plenty of content in the scriptures about it, but we don't hear that in the national talks, or we don't hear that in the national conferences. When are we gonna to start to hear the voice of the immigrant in, in the, on stage? So then they can get inspired and they can see that they can have that relationship with God. And the other reality is that this group has now 800 young adults attending every week the different ministries that they have. I invite you to find another diocese that have 800 young adults attendees every week actively. There are no many. So let's pay attention to this and let's address it with the different types of ministry that you do, how we're gonna address this reality. The reality is the charismatic movements that Andres was so generous to share with us to see the impact that they are creating in the, in the church. How are we gonna open doors for them so the faith formation can continue to the different resources that we can offer? Understanding what is the uniqueness and what is the message that they are sending to them. Because friends, this is what is the difference. Think about it. When, as a Hispanic member, you don't speak the language well, or you might speak the language, but maybe you don't have the emotional connections to all the words that you are using. And you add that to a different background experience. For example, for example, when Mr. Rogers' movie came out, I saw the excitement in my office, especially one of my colleagues. I watched the movie and I was like, and that's it? <laughs> because I didn't have any emotional connection. However, if I talk to you about Topogillo, which was the show that I watched as a little kid, if you're from Spain, you know what I'm talking about, and if you're from Latin America, you went like, yeah! That's the connection that we have. So when we're trying to have a dialogue, but our past experiences are not the same, there is another gap there. And then the other reality is that because of the child protection rules, we have ignored, or not ignored, we have demand that the touch doesn't exist anymore. And the Hispanic community express love by touching. Actually, Jesus healed by touching, but we are not allowing that. So how come we can encourage a new generation where the language, where the experience, and where the physical contact is no longer present and talk to them about relationship with Christ? As a church, we need to be very creative to see how, what other way we can connect them emotionally so they can have that encounter with Christ. Co-responsibility in finances. 
Uh, Darius Villa Villanovos is one of my good friends, and he made a one fantastic statement. The budget of an institution is the moral standards of what they believe in. And how many times we look at the budgets of the ministries that we're expecting to do with the Hispanic community or other communities that are minimum to satisfy the needs of the entire community when the healthy budget is on another side when it's satisfying the needs of a small community. I'm not saying that it's unfair and that we need to flip everything around. What I'm saying is, let's be fair to everybody because everybody deserves the same resources. To expect that one person can take care of the well-beings from birth to death of an entire community, do exactly the same job for all the parishes in a diocese than to a team of 17 that are on the other side is not right. Now, I know what you are thinking about. Catherine, we don't want to divide church. I'm glad you said that because I agree. We don't need a divide church. Do you know what we need? We need all of us to learn the skill of archery so we can satisfy the demands of the church that we have in front of us. The other reason that it's important to think about budget and how to bring the voice of the multicultural realities into it is because when you hear the needs of the cultures, then your budget is going to be decided differently. For the Af Anglo community, right now, the big question is, why, where do I belong? Where do I belong? Why should I belong to this church, especially for the communities that don't live in a prominent Catholic environment? That's not an issue for the Hispanic community. They want to belong. They understand very well the universal church. The Anglo community don't understand very well the, the concept of a universal church. But you know where the Hispanic community is struggling with? Self-esteem. That is not for me. Why? Because we can make amazing St. Patrick Day celebrations. But let me tell you, the Hispanic community, we don't have that big of connection with St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Although I am Irish. <laughs> there are some Irish that went to Colombia. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those are the kind of realities that we have to do. And if we want to also be co-responsible with our work as a diocesan director, one of the jobs I learned I have to do very quickly is to start to talk to the parishes that have the everything with the parishes that have the nothing, and I start to make them to communicate with each other. Sometimes we are okay because our parish is okay financially, but we don't care that the parish in 45 minutes from us are struggling to death. We need to start to open up their spaces and say, I have this program, anyone that wants to come, come in. Or can I go to your program? Will we you, will you feel welcome? For those parishes in the rural area that only have four teenagers, are we thinking about them? Are we, think, are we exposing them to a fair share of what the church is? So then we can be co-responsible financially. Co-responsibility in education. Many times I have heard that the Hispanic community doesn't want to learn more, and that couldn't be more grown, and I'm so glad with this kind of research that just came out that says that Hispanic Latinos make up more than 52% of participants in lay ecclesiastic ministry programs right now in the nation. The first time that we flip, we are majority for certifications in any Catholic institution, in any diocesan level, and in the nation. When the white and Anglo communities are just 37%, the blacks 3%, Asia Pacific 3%, and others uh, is the other 6%. They are eager to learn. My question to you is, do you have a space for them to learn in your programs? Have you created an area for them to do so? That 52%, the reality of the church, we're talking about 30 million Hispanic young adults that are ready to build the church. Where I saw a co-responsibility reaction that was positive was in the Archdiocese of Atlanta. They actually have a very good partnership between the Archdiocese and the University of Dallas that have created a certificate for the Hispanic community in theology. So far, they have had 210 students that graduated from a three-year online program with 98% retention. If you know about online programs, that is magnificent. And what is the success of that program? 40% of the payment for that education comes from the diocese, 15% comes from the student, and the other 15% comes from the parish. 
What a great way to partner among each other. But not only that, the diocese have satisfied whatever needs are essential for the success of these students. For example, we found that many, many students, they have computers, but the computer is used by the students, by their children, so they don't have time to do their homework. So the diocese laying um, some computers around while they were doing the studies, and when they finish, they pass the computer to the next student. And it has been a complete success. Why this is impactful? Because from those 2010, uh, 210 students that have graduated, many are now employees for the parishes, serving in the different positions of the church. That is fantastic, especially when we know that now more than 70% of our employees in parishes are above the age of retirement. So guess where we, need, we can uh, collect the, the, the gifts of the people? Corresponsibility in teaching. There is no way that knowing the realities of the church right now, we cannot think that anyone receiving any kind of certification from any kind of institution should involve the reality of the immigrant church. No learning about it is a disservice for the success of your ministry in the future, especially in the next 20 years. Any content that is built from now on in the church should have a lens of the realities of the multicultural church so they can feel part of whatever great content you are creating. All of us ministries, if you already have all the degrees, all of the information that you have, it's time for us to practice that skill. And I'm not asking or requesting people to learn Spanish. That's not it. Although if you say hola to me, you melt my heart. But it's just simple things. Is just to learn and practice and be exposed to the reality so we can serve the church, the real church that we have in front of us. And I personally invite any or, uh, uh, organization or especially Catholic University to start to be more aggressive in the recruitment of the leadership of the diverse church because we need to create a new generation of theologians that don't speak the reality of what's happening in Spain or Latin America, but that they speak the realities that's happening right here because of their own experiences as immigrants. Now, let me give you finally a best co-responsibility experience that I have. Another reality that we have in the culture of the church is the Catholic speakers that go from conference to conference all around the nation, and they express and share their gifts to the nation. That's great. However, my big issue with that is that many times we are not practicing ministry itself. We are just becoming a show producers. We kind of like go and do our thing and then we leave. There is no the compromise to work more in depth with the places that we're invited to be at. So I'm going to share with you the, one of the most amazing experiences that I have. And it was a, we, I was invited by Archbishop Gustavo to their assembly in San Antonio. This is his requirements. First. He expects all the um, speakers to arrive the day before of the event. He invited us to meet him at the cathedral at 6 o'clock. And he planned a prayer with us for like an hour, an amazing prayer with us for like an hour. It was Archbishop Gustavo and the other speakers and a few of his employees. Then after that, he invited us to share. Uh, then after that, he came and said, this is who, I, who we are, this is our cathedral. Let us uh, tell me a little bit about the history of my diocese. Then after that, he talked about his people. Then he invited us to have dinner, and during the dinner, he sit us around with the people from his diocese. So we, during conversation, we can share the expertise that we had, but they were able to tell us more about who they are. At the end of dinner, he said, I want you to go back home uh, to the hotel and have a good night's sleep, because tomorrow we have a big day. The next day, we started with prayer, we had mass, and then I went and did my talk. I assure you, I always try to do my best in presentations because I'm representing them at Grad Institute and I want them to be proud. But that day, I gave 200% because I saw the, the respect toward my, towards my expertise, but I also saw the respect that Archbishop Gustavo gave me to his community. I thought that was the end. I was living completely joyful from that experience. He was waiting for me outside of the room, and he looked at me and he said, Catherine, I heard great things about your talk. Then he held my hand and he said, but tell me, what did you see? What should I be aware of? Any signs, anything that I have to pay attention to? That blew my mind. 
Of course, if you ask me a question, if you know me, I have three points. <laughs> and then after that, I left. Are we creating a culture of co-responsibility to all the national speakers that are going around talking about different topics? Are we challenging them? Or are we just treating them like the stars that go around, just throw their material and they just move on and they don't feel impactful in the ministry? So here is my closing before questions. Look at this family. I know this family. Believe it or not, she was one of the girls that was in one of my youth ministries at the beginning, so that's how old I am. My question to you is, do you see them? Do you see them in your ministries, or are they missing? Do they feel welcome once they arrive? And most importantly, do you love them? And when we talk about the multicultural church, here is my question. Would you miss them if they are gone? Would you miss them if they are gone? Thank you so much. I'm open for questions. Um, in our parish, we have, it's a 150-year-old parish, and so we have um, a lot of very old people, and we also have started to get um, a lot more Hispanics, and we're up to about 25% of our parish being Hispanic. So we have these, we have a Hispanic minister, and we have a wonderful Our Lady of Guadalupe celebration, <coughs> and we have like taco dinners at, along with our pancake breakfast, and we're doing all kinds of things, but we don't seem to be doing a bilingual anything well. Mm -hmm. We have the Hispanics go to the Hispanic, Anglos go to the Anglo. So do you feel like we should really, I guess I'm asking your opinion if bilingual, does that actually serve anybody or is that forcing something and really doesn't serve anybody? The best way that I can look at it is when we see the narrative of the birth of Christ. It comes from two different Gospels serving two different communities. But when you are able to have the gift to know both Gospels, you have a beautiful picture of the birth of Christ. That's the invitation that I have for you. Don't look at it as how we can change one to the other. You know what is the ideal? The dream is that when everybody goes to a celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, it's because everybody is emotionally connected to the celebration of the, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Or if you have the pancake breakfast, it's because everybody is connected to the deliciousness of a pancake. <laughs> That's what we're really seeking for. And I think the second and third generation are gonna take us there. The thing is, when we are trying to force something that doesn't come naturally, it's not gonna work. I have seen horrible bilingual masses because it's to the point that no one knows what language is going on at some point. And I'm bilingual, my brain changes, and I'm going like, I have a headache right now. I, this is not working. But I have also seen very successful bilingual masses when they are actually inviting the community to pray together. What does it mean? It might mean that you might need to learn one song in Spanish and try to have that emotional connection to it. So the entire group can have one song in Spanish but then the reading can be in English. What we need to do is to start to create building bridges between the two cultures so both can benefit from the gift of that the other is bringing about the journey of faith. The beauty of it is that the new generations don't see those differences. How many of our young adults are celebrating, no matter where they come from, the Cinco de Mayo? For many other reasons, but they celebrate the Cinco de Mayo, right? <laughs> Or the, of the Dia de los Muertos. Now we have Coco the movie, and now everybody loves Coco the movie. <laughs> little by little, we are incoming. Does it mean that we're gonna become Mexicans for those of you that are afraid? No, it doesn't mean that. Don't worry. There is a lot more to life. What it means is that we are starting to become the body of Christ. That's what we are seeking for. So don't, the, the mistake is to embrace ministry in a territorial way. 
we need to be open so the Holy Spirit is the one that can transform our hearts and we can open up to the community that he is helping us embrace. Actually, he's desiring that we embrace it because then we will be able to know a little bit more about him. That's, that's the goal and that's the purpose. Don't get frustrated. It's a step by step. You cannot change a culture in one day. But I can tell you, in the last year, I went to 26 dioceses because dead parishes flip in a year, last year alone. That's why I was traveling everywhere, for those of you that work with me, that's what I was. <laughs> Any other question? Mm -hmm. I'm from Toronto, and we're the most culturally diverse archdiocese in North, well, in Canada. Um, um, our big push right now is with ministry with maturing adults, so anybody who's 50 and older. I'm wondering, is that uh, something that the Hispanic community is in search of, or is most of the um, energy behind uh, attracting the youth? I wish it was the energy attracted to the youth. But unfortunately, if you go to any national conference right now, and you see the Hispanic community, and you see a huge number of participants, most likely you are talking to the grandmas and grandparents. The new parents, and this is the big difference, the Hispanic community, the Hispanic couples are getting married a lot younger than the Anglo community, and they are having a lot more kids before the age of 30. They are having a different behavior than the Anglo community. So they are busy with two or three jobs, and they're busy raising two, three, four children. So the ones that are staying in track to keeping the faith is the, the grandparents. And that is good for now, and I just want to warn you, if you think Hispanic ministry is not gonna be needed in the next 30 years, I tell you, we're gonna need Hispanic ministry at least for 40 years, so until that generation moves around. But this new generation, the ones that they don't have the identity in the Catholic Church yet, they are the ones that we should be paying attention to, because the beauty of the older generation is that they have the roots of the faith based from their experience back home. This generation doesn't have that root. And we need to create those roots quickly because otherwise they are gonna lose the opportunity to grow in the faith in the Catholic Church. First of all, Catherine, thank you for a magnificent presentation for us and especially with the, the passion with which you speak of and dedication with which you speak of the communities that you serve. My question deals with the, the, precisely the group that you're identifying as youth and young adults. They are not a monolithic group either and the complexities of dealing with, for example, the, the more immigrant connected uh, community of young adults and those who are second, third generation. And it, it strikes me that their cultural backgrounds are so different. What are some of the complexities that then occur in, in ministering uh, to these mm -hmm. folks and in cultivating their leadership for the future church? Mm -hmm. I think the frustration of the second and third generation is every time they go to the parents and say, but it's hard. It's hard to be in a school. It's hard to do this. It's hard to learn a second language. It's hard to do this. You know what the parents answer them? Hard? I have to walk 10 miles without shoes for 10 hours to collect one glass of water so when I come back, I could have the glass of water for grandma every day. <laughs> I'm not denying the pain of the two realities. The problem is they don't receive the support from home because the parents cannot relate to the realities of the church right now or they simply life right now here in the United States. But at the same time, the Anglo community cannot understand the reality of an immigrant uh, in their presence. Because they, in, in, when we go back home, we, will, we get questioned how we criticize when we are so spoiled and we have so much. When we go to the Anglo community, you are like, you don't have enough and you don't understand. <laughs> you are doing this wrong. Just keep making corrections. I don't know how many grammatical mistakes I made in this presentation. Trust me, I know there are plenty. But, and I have a, a, a bachelor's in modern languages. I speak three languages, English is my third. But I will always have to keep the humility to turn to you and say, I'm sorry if I make that mistake. Actually, before I presented, I have to ask a few of my colleagues, how you pronounce that word? Just to make sure I didn't say something wrong. The beauty of the, this tension is that if you add humility to it, both sides 
will be strengthened by. And that, isn't that the part of the journey of faith, to be just be humble enough to say, I don't know, can you help me? And for those of you that you see others suffering, can you just lay in the hand so that you can support them and help them push a little bit farther? That's the invitation that we should embrace at this point. Friends, maybe one last question. Um, I'm from Kenya. Mm -hmm. I'm a seminarian working in um, Johnson City area. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, one of the challenges, this is just an observation, um, one of the challenges I think for somebody coming from another continent like myself from Africa and ending up in Johnson City, Tennessee. <laughs> um, I know that place, trust me. <laughs> yes. I think there are many, many layers of learning there and um, I never thought I was gonna come in, um, in contact with a Hispanic community, uh, let alone the, the Anglos that I'm supposed to serve. And um, this is a Baptist you know, territory. And um, just so many layers of looking at what multicultural um, living is. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the challenge of the reality of those coming to this country to serve our mother church. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And to answer you that, every time people ask me, Catherine, what mass do you go to? Do you go to the Hispanic mass or the Anglo mass? I don't have a problem to go to either. I personally like to eat with community, so I just go to the community. But if there is something that is very deep in my heart that I really need to talk with God, I assure you I'm gonna be on my knees and most likely speaking in Spanish. I'm probably singing a song in Spanish. Why? Because that's how God created me. To give you an experience of Johnson City, I received this question when I worked there. Catherine, tell me how did you feel when you knew for the first time that God listened to your prayers? So I thought they were talking about like an encounter, a prophetic moment. And then they said, yes, when you finally spoke English and God was able to listen to your prayer. Welcome to Johnson City. Now you know what I was dealing with. So that's the reality of the church. Whatever you do, don't do that. Thank you so much. <laughs>